This week's blog post is some illustrations for Amor Towles, the Di Domenico Fragment. Towles is the author of Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow, both of which I enjoyed. He recently released The Di Domenico Fragment. A fictional Renaissance painting gives the novella its title, and its narrator mentions a number of other artworks. As an art historian, I couldn't resist posting images of some of them. Note that this post was made without the knowledge or permission of Mr. Tolles or his publishers. It contains no spoilers. For now, the novella is available only on Audible. You can sign up for Tolles' email list to receive notices of his works. There's a link to that in the blog post. Chapter 3 of the Di Domenico fragment includes a discussion of a number of versions of the Annunciation that were painted in Italy during the Renaissance. I thought I would give you a short prelude to that with a couple medieval Annunciations. These remind us that some aspects of the Annunciation iconography, the way it's shown typically, such as the landscape background, the architectural interior, were not developed until the Renaissance when artists once again became interested in representing this world as well as the supernatural realm. So the stained glass windows from Chartres have no realistic background at all. And the ones on the right simply have a burnished gold background. The one on the right of this slide has a building, and that's different from the two that we've seen so far, but the linear perspective in that building is done by the eye. It's not quite right. This painting, in fact, was created only a few years before Masaccio introduced mathematically calculated linear perspective in his painting The Tribute Money, which was done in the mid-1420s. Now let's go to some Renaissance Annunciations. Tolls mentions Annunciations by Fra Angelico, Filippo Lippi, Piero della Francesca, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, and Raphael, with specific dates for each painting. I'm including here examples of Annunciations by all those artists. However, many of the artists painted several versions of this subject, and few Renaissance paintings actually have definitive dates. Since Tolles' narrator doesn't mention the current locations of the paintings that he's thinking of, I can't guarantee that the paintings below are the ones that the narrator had in mind. But at least they're the right artists and the right decade. It's also interesting to look at these in terms of the artist's interpretations of the subject, particularly the relationship between the Archangel and Mary. Are they in motion? Are they moving toward each other or holding still? And are they making eye contact? So on the left is an early one by Fra Angelico and slightly later one on the right by Fra Filippo Lippi. On the left is one by Piero della Francesca, and on the right one that's been attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. There are similarities to his later works, but it's a matter of some discussion whether he actually did this all by himself. It's not signed. This one, upper left, is a Botticelli, uh, 1481, in fact, the very end of the 15th century. And the one by Raphael at the lower left is the very beginning of the 1500s. And just as a bonus one, this is by Giovanni Bellini. It isn't mentioned in the Di Domenico fragment. I've included it because the robes of the angel are just so startling. After the Annunciations, we move on to the Metropolitan Museum. In Chapter 7, the narrator of the Di Domenico fragment takes his teenage relative to the Metropolitan Museum. You can get a sense of the size and the sprawling growth of that institution in my post on dianderantiwriter.com about the history of the Metropolitan Museum's building. The sketch from that is on the left here. The Lehman Gallery, which the narrator visits, is a pentagonal wing on the west side of the museum, and this is the outside of it, the way it looks on from Central Park. The narrator mentions a Lorenzo Monaco painting of the Nativity, down around 1406 to 1410, that is in the Lehman Wing, and it hangs right by a Botticelli Annunciation from about 1485 to 92. Both of these are rather small, like the span of your hand wide, perhaps. And then there are a few other works that the narrator mentions at the Metropolitan Museum. He has lunch with his relative in the Petri Court Cafe, which is a couple galleries south of the Lehman Wing. You can look out the Petri Court's glass wall and see the 
obelisk, also known as Cleopatra's Needle in Central Park. That's right there. Right over here, difficult to see, is this sculpture of Ugolino, which is mentioned in the novella. In chapter 12 of my book Innovators in Sculpture, I used Ugolino as a benchmark for the achievements of sculptors by the late 19th century. But it is certainly not a cheerful piece. Nor is Rodin's Burgers of Calais, which is right back here. And the one that we'll look at after that is right here. So they're all right in the line. Rodin's Burgers of Calais, 1884 to 1895, is based on a grim episode from the Hundred Years' War between England and France. In 1347, the English had been besieging the French coastal town of Calais for 11 months. With no relief in sight, the townspeople sued for surrender. King Edward of England replied that they would be spared if six of their leaders would emerge from the town, carrying the keys to the town and the castle, and wearing nooses around their necks. Six men volunteered for what seemed to be a suicide mission. And that is the moment that is shown by Rodin in this sculpture. The lives of the six burghers were eventually spared by the intercession of Edward's wife. But the English took and held Calais for more than a century. The Burgers of Calais and other works by Rodin are discussed in Chapter 12 of Innovators in Sculpture. And here is, on the right, is Perseus with the Head of Medusa, another not really cheerful sculpture. The narrator takes his teenage relative to the Arms and Armor Gallery, which is shown on the left, and their last stop is at the Studiolo, which was created around 1470 to 1482 for the Duke's Palace in Gubbio, which is in Perugia, Italy. It was based, the studiolo was based on a design by Francesco di Giorgio Martini, and the pictures are all inlaid wood. Even this, which looks like it's a table, is, is actually trompe l'oeil, inlaid wood. The narrator talks to his teenage relative about a painting by Van Gogh of irises. That's the one on the left here. It was painted in 1889 and it was sold in 1987 to Australian Alan Bond for $54 million. The painting is now in the Getty Museum. The Metropolitan Museum has a different painting of irises by Van Gogh, which is on the right-hand side. And finally, a bonus piece. My favorite Renaissance Annunciation is not mentioned by Tolson's narrator. It is Donatello's Cavalcanti Annunciation, done around 1433. It's in Santa Croce in Florence. This Annunciation shows Mary actually recoiling as a winged figure appears in front of her. Donatello sculpted medieval subjects, but he rethought every composition and theme, not just for the Annunciation, but for the Madonna and Child, for David, for St. George, and for many more. See Innovators in Sculpture, Chapter 8. And that's it for this week. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantiWriter.com. As always, thanks for listening.